Human people, it is good to see you. You're supposed to say that it's good to see me. See, when I say it to you, it makes you feel good. And you're like, oh, I'm a human person and it's good to see me. And then you're supposed to say it's good to see you too, human person. That's how polite people do things. So, human people, it's good to see you. It's good to see you too. Aww, I'm going to take all of that as kind human words. Okay, so this week we've talked about a few different things, but we've really focused on one particular thing. And I'm curious if anyone feels like they can sum up what we've talked about so far. Okay. Sure. So the first one was how your mind. Uh huh. Okay, yep, mm hmm. Second one is about Okay. You're doing great? Yes, or the Bible. Yes. Yes, yes. And we've really been focusing on that main theme, and you hit it perfectly how our minds affect our hearts, which affect our wills. What we think changes what we love, which changes what we do. And we as Christians want to be people who do things that honor Jesus. We want to do good works so that people will see and glorify uh, our Father. We want to do good works because we know that God prepared them in advance for us to do, and for many other reasons. But if we just focus on what we do, a lot of times we find ourselves frustrated because we can't seem to get what we do right. And we struggle to do the right thing, and we find ourselves doing the wrong thing. And we should notice from this week that we do the wrong things because we love the wrong things, and we love the wrong things because we think the wrong things. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. All right, so today we're going to keep pressing forward. And yesterday we spoke about how unique and powerful and special the Bible is as God's Word to form and change how and what we think. When God speaks, it changes things. But the Bible is not the only thing that shapes us. There are other things, and we're going to look today at one other thing. And before we jump into it, I want you to just think in your mind, what influences you the most? What do you think are the things or the people who have the most or the greatest impact on how you think? Just think about it for a second. Okay, what do you think? Ourselves and our parents. Okay, you influence yourself and your parents influence you. That is definitely true. Any other thoughts on what might influence you guys the most? Yeah? Technological devices. Ooh, how do those technological devices influence you? Uh, especially with like ads and stuff. Oh yeah, you see an ad and you're like, I must eat that taco. I must make this in-game purchase. Okay, what do you mean by culture? What everyone else around you is doing. That definitely affects us. That's huge. Friends. Your friends. And what kind of influence do you think your friends have on you? Peer pressure. Okay, peer pressure, good or bad, and the example they set, and all kinds of other things. Those are awesome and great. Oh, God. God, definitely. He should be the ultimate influencer in our lives. We should be listening to him, following him more than anyone else. And one of the awesome things about how God works is he uses his word. He uses the people around us. He uses our families to point us, grow us, stretch us, and teach us. And as a person who has been involved with Christian ministry for a good while, uh, I was... I grew up in a Christian family. I went to church. I went to youth group. I went to a Christian homeschool co-op group. Yeah. I went to a Christian college and then um, studied Christian things in graduate school. I teach at a Christian school and have worked at a Christian church. Um, so in my life, I've been around a lot of Christian people, Christian activities, and Christian things. And I've gotten to interact with a, a lot of people, especially a lot of young people like you. And I love doing that. But one of the hardest things about working with Christian young people is that when they become old people, they don't always still seem to have the same 
love for Jesus that they had when they were young. And you might have a friend or a family member or somebody that you know who has drifted from their faith, even someone who grows up in a good family, in a good church, going to a good camp, sometimes can end up not who you thought that they were. And if you've ever experienced that, um, that can be hard. And if you haven't experienced that, you probably will. There are people around you that uh, you look at and you think about and you see them on the outside and don't necessarily know what's going on on the inside. And we can very, very easily, as people, drift. And many people fade because of different reasons. Maybe they didn't get off to a good start or maybe they got pulled into other things because of the culture or their friends or the people around them. Maybe they thought that there were things besides Christ that could satisfy them or give them greater enjoyment. And when I'm talking about these people, I just want to remind you that I'm not talking about people who are outsiders or who are marginal. The people who have memorized, you know, all the verses to all the hymns in all of your favorite six editions of a hymnal, those people can struggle too. And the fact is that growing up in a church or a Christian school or a homeschool group, or a Christian family, or a Christian camp, does not necessarily mean that you are a follower of Jesus. Because things like Chehi are called Christian camps, but camps can't know Christ. Who can know Christ? People. People. So I I work at a Christian school, and that's great, but my school is not going to be... Uh, in heaven, my school is not going to be is not saved by what Jesus did on the cross, right? It's it's only people, and so there's a lot of times where people who are part of Christian things might not actually be Christians themselves. And you might have heard things like this: Well, if you're in a garage, that doesn't make you a car, or if you're in a silverware drawer, that doesn't necessarily make you a utensil. And that's true. And I want to press on that a little bit today and just be a little bit serious with you. We've spent a lot of time this week being kind of goofy and ridiculous and silly, but sometimes you got to be very serious. And I want to be serious with you. Many of you have grown up in church buildings, in Sunday school classes, coming to camps like this one, But maybe you're not actually a member of Christ's body. Maybe when I talk about having Christ transform your mind, you're not thinking of, how can I actually live my life for Jesus? You're thinking, I don't know that guy. And some of you might not be sure where you stand. You might not be sure what you think. Some of you might be struggling with things. Why did these bad things happen to me or my family? Or I don't understand. Or how does this fit together? Or this particular situation doesn't seem right to me and I'm having a hard time believing and following and loving Jesus. And I want to speak to you guys today. If you are a Christian, please, please take seriously the fact that not everyone around you in a Christian environment is. And if you are not a Christian please know that there is nothing more important about who you are than you have been made in the image of God and you've been pursued by God and there is nothing better than knowing Him. And so as we have this conversation today, I'm going to pause for a second and pray for you and then we're going to keep going. All right? Let's pray. God, I thank you for these students, and I thank you that in your perfect wisdom you brought them together here. I ask that you would speak through your word, that your Holy Spirit would work in our minds, that you would give great hope to people who don't have it, that you would demonstrate the truth of your gospel to people who don't believe it, and that through your power you would change minds and hearts and wills into your image. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, last night, and the night before, and the night before, we sang hymns at sing time. And a lot of the hymns talked about how great God is, and just how He's unique, and Jesus is special, and we love Him, and we think about what He's done for us, and that the hope that we have in the future. And we all get together, and we do that, and I even, one night, took a took my camera out and uh, recorded one of the songs that you guys sang because it sounded so nice and it was meaningful and it was beautiful. So 
if it ever goes becomes a, a hit, I'll send you all a few cents. But um, no, just kidding. I only shared it with my wife. But we all sing these songs that talk about how great Jesus is, but not everyone who sings about Jesus necessarily believes and follows Jesus. And I want you guys to just think in your mind about the situation on Palm Sunday. So just take a moment, think in your brain, if you know what Palm Sunday was and what it was about, go through your thoughts, try to envision it in your mind, and then I'm going to ask somebody in a second to share what happened on Palm Sunday. So let's just take a moment in your brain, see if you can picture it, remember all the important details. Okay, would someone be willing to share what went down on Palm Sunday? Yes. Right. Yep. Well, first, what I remember is that Jesus asked his disciples to go ask this guy, well, go take this donkey. Go Get take this donkey. donkey. Yeah, and he said that if the guy owns the donkey, comes out and asks him why they're taking it, tell the, tell the farmer or whatever that the Lord needs it. God needs it. Yeah, and so the disciples go out get the donkey, the farmer comes out and asks, why are you guys taking this donkey? And they responded to God. Well, God needs it. And so we think back to Jesus, and Jesus goes into Jerusalem, and everyone's praising him. So, so they have coats on the ground in front of his donkey. And also, back then, donkeys were a sign of peace. Okay. So Jesus is riding in on this donkey, and people are throwing their coats and stuff on the ground, and they're, are they saying any? They're doing what? Waving the palm branches. W waving the palm branches and, and are hallelujah. shouting hallelujah. And also, back then, like, if you came in on a horse, then everybody that's like a sign of battle. Like, if you came, came in on a horse, if you came in on a donkey, that's a sign of peace. Cool. Yeah, so let me just read. That's a great, perfect, well said. I'm going to read this a couple verses. This is from John 12, 12 through 13. Um, you can look it up if you want, but no pressure. It says... The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Now I'm just going to pause there. There is a great crowd in Jerusalem. They all gather. They know Jesus is coming. You might have caught that. The next day, a great crowd that had come heard that Jesus was coming. So they're like, oh man, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. They're getting, you know, hyped up. And they're like, yeah, Jesus is coming. Okay, did you get your tickets? Yeah, you know, like 50-yard line, four rows back. I'm about to season Jesus. And they're all excited about it. And... Uh, there's this, this crowd, and they gather together, and they don't just watch Jesus, they celebrate Jesus. Um, they, they say, Hosanna, which means God saves. So they're, they're yelling out this truth. God saves. Our God is a Savior. Our God is a Savior. God saves. And they're calling him their king. They say, blessed is the king of Israel. So they're, they're not confused about who Jesus is or what he's doing. They also said, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So they're saying, Jesus has God's stamp of approval. He's our king, and he's coming because God saves. That's a, that's a pretty good theology. That's really strong about who, who Jesus is. And when they're saying he's the king, and they're saying he's from God, and they're saying that God is using him to save, they're making big, huge statements. And it reminds me a little of our time here when we celebrate at sing time. We'll say things like, all creatures of our God and our King should raise our voices and sing and praise Him. We say those kinds of things together. Or we'll sing songs that celebrate the gospel and what Jesus has done for us. Or we'll celebrate what Jesus will do. The fact that he has won a battle that guarantees our future. And we'll be like, yes, one day all these things that are wrong are going to be made right. All these things that are broken are going to be made whole. And we think, yes, and we sing those things. And that's sort of what was going on here. We do a lot of, yes, Hosanna, our God saves. Yes, blessed is Jesus who comes with God's stamp of approval. Yes. Blessed is the king. But I want to fast forward a little bit because even though they were honoring Jesus and expressing faith in him and even saying that they were pledging their allegiance to him, a few days later, this same crowd was in a little bit of a different situation. 
So I'm, I'm going to do something that's a little shocking and just like fast forward. So imagine you were watching a TV show and uh, back in the day there were these things called DVDs. <laughs> they were round and they looked like a CD but they were they were DVDs and nowadays you just you can watch all the things on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon or whatever it might be but but they, there used to be these things and if you if you want to find out more about them you can talk to any of the elderly in the back and they will explain but one of the things that used to be about DVDs is if if you watched a show on DVD, one DVD might have episodes 1 through 4 and the next one 5 through 8 and the next one 9 through 12 and if you lost a disc and you jumped forward from episode 4 to episode 9 you'd miss some important stuff and it'd be sort of shocking like what happened that person has a goatee now and uh, it would be confusing but here's what I'm gonna do I'm just gonna say we're gonna just skip a disc and it's meant to be shocking okay so um, we got watched the first few episodes on this disc and then we lost that disc and now we're going to this disc and in mark 15 6 through 15 this is a long chunk but just listen to this and if you can try to visualize it think about it in your mind God's Word says this now it was a custom at the festival do you remember in the last couple verses that I read where there's a mention of the festival so there's same crowd, same time, same festival. It was a custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one that you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! And wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. So same festival, same crowd, same people, same location. The crowd that won just, just a little bit earlier, one disc earlier, was saying, Hosanna, our God is a Savior. He sent this guy, Jesus, with his own, God has sent him with his own stamp of approval. He's the king. And then right around the corner, the same crowd in the same place is saying something else. What are they saying now? Crucify him. Crucify him. In other words, they're saying, he's not our king. This, is, this guy is, is not worthy of our praise. I'm not laying my, you know, I'm not laying my coat down in front of his donkey. I, I want him dead. Now, what could happen to change people's mind that quickly? Same people, same place, same festival. One minute they're saying, we love this guy. And the next minute they're saying, we really need to kill this guy. And that's scary. We need to think about why did they say this? What caused this change? And there's, there are a lot of things going on here, but there's one key thing I want to point out in your mind. And that is, there's a section in what I just read where it said the chief priests stirred the crowd up. If you're a part of a crowd, you act like the people that you're around. So when Jesus first came in, the people got stirred up. And they were like, yes, Jesus is the man. I love Jesus. Jesus is, is worthy. Jesus is great. Jesus is saving. And then the crowd is together again, and they, they get stirred up in a different way. And they, they're saying, Jesus is the worst. Jesus needs to die. we got to crucify Jesus. And it's because the crowd was getting stirred up. The people acted like the other people that they were around. They were easily swayed, especially by people who were over them or leading them or had some power over them. This is just what crowds do. Who we are with 
shapes who we are. Listen to me. Who we are with shapes how we think. And how we think shapes what we love, and what we love shapes what we do. So, those around us affect how we understand the truth. Those around us affect our minds. Now, these people were not stupid, okay? The, the crowd that was gathered together was all kinds of people from all kinds of walks of life with all kinds of jobs and all kinds of families and all kinds of different levels on how much money they had and what they enjoyed. They were, it was a diverse group, a giant crowd from all over the place. And they weren't doing this because they were ignorant or foolish. They were, they were doing this because they got, they got stirred up. They got affected in their minds. And some of us, <clears throat> all of us, are like this too. And you like the things that you like in large part because of the people that you're with. If you like baseball, you probably like it because you like who you watch it with. Or you like who you throw the ball with. Or you like being a part of a team. But if your experience was negative, if someone on your team was really mean, or every time you went out there, someone just decided to throw the ball at your face, then you probably aren't going to be like, yes, I love baseball, because you'd be thinking, oh man, these guys are jerks, baseball players are jerks, baseball's the worst. And that's not true, baseball's not the worst, second best under tennis. Um, but uh, yes? Yeah. Oh, uh the chief priests, I believe they offered them money. Mm. Say, really sure. So there's a lot of things that we understand motivate people. And the chief priests had a big interest in motivating these people to help Jesus, help them crucify Jesus. And whatever they could do, whatever it would take to get their plan accomplished, they were willing to do. They were trying to influence the crowd. And all of us are influenced by our crowd. All of us are influenced by our peers. All of us are influenced by our leaders. So, what do we do with this? How do we know, how do we know what to do as we move forward? Because here you are in a Christian place with Christian people. So is it normal for you to act Christian or non-Christian? It's pretty normal for you to act like a Christian when everyone else around you is acting like a Christian. You're a part of the crowd, doing what the crowd does. But do you think that you're going to be a part of a predominantly Christian crowd everywhere you go, all throughout your life? Maybe ask some of your, if you're in a lesson today, ask some of your teachers what their graduate school experience was like. Um, or uh, ask people what it's like to, if they grew up in, and moved and got involved in an arts community, or lived in a big city, or um, what, what happened when they moved out of their house and they went to college, or whatever that might be. Oftentimes, as your situation changes and the people around you change, people start to think differently about what's important to them and about who they really are. And you could very easily find yourself, listen to me, I'm not speaking to the person next to you, I'm talking to you. You could very easily find yourself your convictions, your priorities, swayed by the people around you. And it's important that we recognize that that could happen. And we want to deal with this issue now. I want to ask you just to think in your brain. This is a rhetorical question. Are you a follower of Jesus? Or are you a follower of people who follow Jesus? Are you a follower of Jesus? Or are you a follower of people who follow Jesus? And don't get me wrong, I'm not downing that. We need leaders. In fact, Paul said in one of my favorite verses, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he says, follow my example like I follow Christ. There's nothing wrong with following other people. But you need to know who you really are. You need to know if, are you a Christian because your family goes to church? Are you a Christian because you like the culture or because you like sacred music or because it seems nice and people have good values? Or are you a Christian because you love the Jesus that you know? It's really important for you to think about. You need to assess yourself. What do you really believe about God? Because you may be in the Christian crowd, but that's not really the question. When you arrive at the end of your life and you see Jesus face to face, he doesn't say, I saw you in the crowd, so you're in. He either says, I know you, or I never knew you. 
And this is a big thing for each of us to think about. I know you, or I never knew you. And there's a difference be between being a, a person in a Christian community versus a person who is in Christ. Listen to some of these things where the Bible talks about what it means to be in Christ. It is only in Christ that you are a new creation. That's from 2 Corinthians 5.17. It is only in Christ that you become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21. It is only in Christ that you are saved and sanctified, that you're made like Christ from 1 Corinthians 1.2. It is only in Christ that you can find peace. Philippians 4, 7. And the list could go on. But you cannot find what you can find in Christ anywhere else. And there are a lot of people who like the Christian things apart from the Christ that makes those things good. So I want to ask you a few questions. Once again, these are rhetorical. But I'm just going to walk you through our process that we've been working on all week. And I know this has not been a high-energy chapel. It's been kind of like serious. And I haven't told any stories about weird things. But um, I think that you guys are mature, thoughtful, young adults. Now you might be like, I can't be an adult. My voice hasn't changed. Um, <laughs> you might be singing alto, but you are a young adult. Okay? You might have just got your first sample stick of deodorant but you are a young adult. And you can think as a mature person. So listen to me. Listen to me. Set aside the people around you. Think. Think about this. Do you believe the truth that Jesus is the Almighty God? Do you really believe that He can do whatever He wants and what He wants is you? Do you believe that he pursued you by lowering himself from the perfection and the glory and the, the, the just beauty of heaven that's beyond our comprehension to become a human person like you with all our pains and problems? Do you believe that he lived a perfect life that you could never live? And do you believe that he actually died a criminal's death on the cross that you deserved? Do you believe that he rose again? to prove that everyone who believes in Him can live with Him forever? Those are all belief questions aimed at your mind. Do you believe that Jesus is who the Bible says He is? And let me tell you how you can see if you actually believe it. Does your belief make you love Him? Not do you know a lot about Him. Not are you like a Bible trivia champion. Not do you know all the hymns. Not can you, you know, look back at all the t-shirts from the mission trips that you've been on. The question is, does the belief that you have that Jesus, the Son of God, became a human person, died a criminal's death, rose again, and did it for you, does that belief make you love Him? Does it move your heart to know, to know that He did this for you? Is your mind and what you believe actually moving you? Your affections, your passions, your desire to know Him, to be with Him, to care for Him. Does this truth, the truth that He did all of this, does it impact your desire? Does it impact your gratitude? Does it make you appreciate Him? See, there are times in my life, especially when I was young, and I thought what meant being a Christian was like doing all the right Christian things. And you were much more holy if you could accurately sing the tenor part in a hymnal. But, I'm, be, I'm obviously being ridiculous, but we think that it's our performance that shows us how much we love God. But it's not. What you know and what you believe is demonstrated by whether or not you actually love Him. And that love is demonstrated in what you do. So if you love Him, let me ask you this. If you are a Christian, does your love for God make you want to live for Him? Not do you do it because you're supposed to or your parents expect you to, but do you do it because you want to? That doesn't mean every day it's all, you know, candy canes and rainbows and happy butterflies that land on your finger and sing you a song. What it... What it does mean is that you want to love God. See, um, 
I mentioned earlier in, in the week that my wife and I, we just recently found out that we're having triplets, which means that she doesn't feel very good very often. So she is feeling sick, and um, it's a lot of times she can't do all the things she used to do, and she's a very capable person, so she used to do a lot. And so when she's pregnant, and she used to do a lot, but now she doesn't do as much, what does that mean for me? I'm doing more. Do you think I want to do more? No. Such a good question. Now, I don't love vacuuming extra or washing extra dishes or doing extra budgety things or checking the mail extra times or doing extra cleaning. I don't, I don't love those things, but you know what I do love? Loving my wife. And so when I see a dirty dish, I'm not like, yes, I love dirty dishes. But you know what I am like? Yes, I love loving my wife. And in your life, you might not love doing all the things that God calls you to do. Following Him often is painful. And when we look in the Bible, we see Christians early on who are being uh, almost killed because they have giant stones thrown at them. Or they get put in prison for sharing the gospel. Do you think that they loved being in prison? They're like, yeah, prison food? Do you, do you think that's what they were doing? But do you think that they loved serving God? Yes. See, this is a question for you, and I really want you to think about it. And I know it, it might seem sort of abstract. You, it might be hard to follow Jesus, and you might not want to wash every dish. But if you love the person, you love sacrificing for that person. You love to love them. And that's what shows up in your will. So we said, your mind affects your heart, which affects your will. Now, if you love, if you know, you know that Jesus did all this for you, you know it, you know for sure, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the highest of highest, became the lowest of lowest, lived the perfect of perfectest, so that he could die a criminal's death, the worst of the worst, for you. And he rose again so that he could live with you forever. He says, I want to be with you, and I'm preparing a special place for you. I want you. If you believe all that in your mind, it should make you love him. And if you really love him and you're saying, I want to be with you too, Jesus. You're amazing. You're beautiful. You're glorious. You're satisfying. You, you lift me up. You build me up. You, you are everything I was ever made to have. And you love him. Then, when it comes to your will, your actions, what you actually do, you'll find yourself wanting to live for Him. You'll find yourself wanting to praise Him, wanting to, save, to serve Him, wanting to thank Him. Not because your mom told you you really should say thank you to people, but because you want to say thank you because you're moved by how much He has done for you. You'll find yourself wanting to follow Him, wanting to share Him. And I want you guys to take this seriously. I do not doubt that any of you here have heard the facts, the truth of the gospel. But I do question whether or not many of you believe it. Because Christianity is not a cultural artifact. It's not a demographic decision. It's whether or not you actually believe in what Jesus has done. Whether or not that moves your heart to love him. And then you'll actually find yourself living for him. He will change your life. But it doesn't, change, it doesn't start with your actions. It starts with your mind. And I want to challenge you. If you find yourself frustrated and you're like, I just can't follow Jesus the way I want to. I keep sinning. I keep messing up. I keep falling. I keep failing. Don't focus on your will. Don't focus on your heart. Focus on your mind. Do you believe it? Do you believe the nails? Do you believe the cross? Do you believe in the manger? Do you believe in what he's promised after? Do you believe the empty tomb? Do you believe it was for you? If so, that will move your heart. And that will move your hands. Does that make sense? Let's pray. God, I thank you for these students. And I pray that for the ones who are here who don't know you, that you would draw them to yourself. That you would teach their minds the reality, the greatness, and the beauty of what you've done and of who you are. And that would change their hearts and change their lives. We want to see you save, and we know that you can do it. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.